Will you bow with me in the word of believing prayer? Lord, we thank you for this day. Great is your mercy toward us. We thank you for another expression of your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Lord, now I stand in this place. I'm in desperate need of you. If you'll be so kind, God, to stand up in my body, think with my mind, speak with my mouth. Lord, if you'll be so kind, turn the ink into blood today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to choose to rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. The words of my dear friend, Pastor Terry Mackey, has God done anything for you that no man, no woman, no boy or girl could do, even if they tried? If that's the case, why don't you give God praise with your hands? The executive pastor, thank you so much for those warm words of introduction, undeserving, and to my dear friend, Pastor Mark Lewis. But last but not least, to our honoree and the esteemed pastor of the Lily Grove Church, Pastor Terry K. Anderson. Let's thank God for him. 32 years of pastoral excellence. 32 years of leading and shepherding and loving and burying and visiting. 32 years of making the book talk. Come on, let's thank God for him. Thank you, Pastor. And let me share publicly what I've already shared with your pastor, who I affectionately call Uncle TK. Thank you uh, for allowing me to come and to share. You know a plethora of preachers. You could have called anyone through the length and breadth of this country and this world, and they would have been excited to be here. Thank you for allowing me to come. He called me. He said, what you doing the second Sunday? Whatever it is, cancel it. I said, it's canceled. I'll be there. And uh, I am grateful for the ministry of Pastor Anderson being able to intersect with this family through marriage. Uh, I first met Pastor Anderson as a young preacher coming in and out of Houston. And one of the first times I got a chance to spend some intimate time with him, he gave me some money and said, sit over there and don't bother me now. Sit down over there, don't, don't bother me. And I'm grateful I've been trying not to bother him, uh, except on yesterday I was trying to get a family feud going. And I asked who fixed the best gumbo, him or Uncle Johnny. And I was being messy. I'm just praying for a cook-off after church or something. That's all I'm praying for. <laughs> Those of you that have your Bibles, I want to call your attention to the 134th number of the song. It reads like this. Come, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth come. Bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. I want to talk about with the Lord's help in your prayers all night long all night long. <laughs> Beloved Lionel Richie, one of the legendary music voices of our time, performs a song entitled All Night Long from his album entitled Can't Slow Down. Lionel Richie in this song invites his audience to take a step back, to take a retreat from responsibility and life and engage in a night of ecstasy for the duration of the evening. Notice he does not invite them for a few seconds, minutes, or moments. He invites his audience to get lost in ecstasy for the duration of the evening. You know, church, there are many things 
that we can find ourselves engaged in or possibly enslaved to for the duration of the evening. The, the evening, the nighttime is a peculiar time of day. Night for some is the welcome reward after a hard day's work. For others, nighttime is that moment of retrieve when you get a chance to stand still from a moving world. For others, nighttime is that solace that you get when the children are asleep. The phone is not ringing. There is no social media for you to check and you say, ah, oh, I'm grateful that it's finally nighttime. For some of us, we welcome nighttime. But if you flip the other side of that coin, nighttime is a metaphor for trying in tax moments. But for someone, nighttime is when your anxieties are high and your options are few. Nighttime for, for someone is when you walk down the aisle and you said for better or for worse, but all you see is worse. That's nighttime. N nighttime is sometimes when you come into God's house and you hear the word and the songs of Zion, but sometimes you leave here not feeling good or God. It is nighttime. It is nighttime in America when black men are beaten and killed by the hands of their own kind. It is nighttime. And can I push this today for a minute? If you never experience nighttime, keep going to bed at night, getting up in the morning. Nighttime will come and knock on your door and say, I am here. Nighttime is a reality. And I don't care how long you've been in church. Don't care what the suffixes are behind your name or how much money you have in the bank. There will come a time in our lives where we will have dark nights of the soul in the words of St. John of the Cross. There will be times where you'll find yourself babysitting the night. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been there? When life is so dark, life is so thick, and the options seem so few, where it seems like you don't know which way to go, and there is no compass to get out of the chaos that you are in. But I came to tell somebody, hold on just a little while longer, because we serve a God that works well in the night season. Look at somebody say, we serve a God who works well in the night season. You don't believe me? I got Bible on my side. Ask the children of Israel while they were navigating the uneven terrain of the wilderness. And God caused a pillar of cloud to follow them by day and a pillar of fire to follow them by night. We serve a God that works well in the night season as Paul and Silas why they were under Roman God and they found themselves in jail they could have rejected God they could have hung their harps and said I'm giving up but they say no come on let's have a prayer meeting and they start praying and singing and God shook the foundation of the prison in the night season come, come here Mary Mary would say an angel interrupted my life in the night time and said blessed are you among women and she said I stopped counting time to my marriage and my wedding but I started counting time by my expanding waistline I want to encourage someone today that divinity has a way of making debuts in our night season. 
I know we live in a hyperculture where everybody say that you're going to be blessed and you can't be stressed. And if you give God your hand, that you won't have any trouble. I don't know who told you that. I want to tell you, don't you buy into that candy cane theology. Job said, man, that's born of a woman. And those few days are filled with trouble. Nighttime. And here, this text calls us to engage God in the night seasons of our lives. May I suggest to you, Lily Grove, that takes a different level of spiritual maturity and dexterity to engage God in night seasons. Because it's easy for us to embrace the God of day and reject the God of night. But here the psalmist says, engage God in the night season. Hear this text. Psalm 134 is the final psalm of the Psalms of Ascent. This is a short psalm, but is a potent psalm. This psalm, the Psalms of Ascent, were sung as the people were engaging in worship. Psalms 133 and Psalms 134 are fraternal twins. Psalms 133 reminds us of the unity that is required for worship. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that is on the head that flows to the beard and flows to the skirts of the garment. Church, there is nothing like when the people of God come together and everyone is on the same page. There is nothing like when the ushers and the deacons and the choir and everyone is on the same page to give God honor, glory, and our Adoration. But Psalm 134 reminds us once we get to God's house, don't forget to do what you came to do. Can I tell you something, church, that there's nothing that confuses me more than when people come to church and they fail to worship God. You've been through too much not to worship God. You had to get up early this morning and fight with children and try to fight to get a parking spot. Put your mask on. Put on your Sunday go meeting clothes for you not to worship God. And can I put a pin right here? There was a time when we could not get to church and we long to get here and for you to be here a few days and start looking at the clock and start acting like move me if you can't no that ain't my disposition this is my disposition I came to worship him I came to lift my hands I came to give him glory I came to sweat out my suit because you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me look at somebody say excuse me if I distract you uh, excuse me if I make you uncomfortable but you don't know what he's done for me uh, and if I had all day you wouldn't have all day so this is what I tell you through many dangers toils and snares I have already come what was it Reverend it was grace says once you get to worship don't you forget to do what you came to do there's a question that is lifted what is the chief aim of man and the answer is in the Westminster Catechism the chief aim of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever that simply means you ought to worship God and you ought to enjoy doing it. This is the little take home truth of this little sermon. Give God honor perpetually knowing that God has a mutual response. Give God honor perpetually 
not sometimes, not occasionally, not based on circumstance, but give God honor and praise perpetually knowing that God has a mutual response for your effort. God unceasingly invites those who have experienced his love and blessings to bless God in return. So there are two quick moves that I want to lift out of this text, and I'll soon be in my seat. If you're going to worship God all night long, we notice there's the invitation to worship. Listen to how the text opens. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. This word come is the universal term of invitation. Come, bless the Lord. Church, this is not a picture of one lesser giving someone greater something. This is not an idea of a lesser individual trying to give divinity material. Because you know, there's never been a time that God has been without. Uh, uh, to, to, to take that is to mean that God is diminished. That God is in need. That, that God has a up and down emotional need. No, God is not like that. We are. But, but this idea, bless, literally means to kneel, to pay honor, to give homage, literally to make a fuss over. May, may I suggest to you, brothers and sisters, we make a fuss over a whole lot of stuff. You, you, you make a fuss over your family, and rightfully so. You, you, you make a fuss over your finances. You're, you're going to Charles Schwab and all the other financial institutions because you want to make sure that you can retire in the right way. Uh, we, we, we make a fuss over the, the politicals and our democracy. Our democracy is under stress like never before. The fabric of our democracy is being stretched in ways that we never imagined. We, we make a fuss over vibes and our feelings. And if you're not careful, we'll start making a fuss over everything in church. Who's going to stand on this door? Who's going to lead the song? And what color are we going to wear? But my problem is there are too many people in church that's making a fuss over everything and everybody else and my question is when was the last time you made a fuss over God it was God that blessed your family it's God that's giving you the ability to get wealth it's God that's taking care of your church the problem is we're making a fuss over everybody except God Come, bless the Lord. There's some invitations that are particular. He says, come, bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Come, bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Wait a minute, this, this is a psalm of ascent. The people are leaving Jerusalem. It looks like the sun is tiptoeing across the western horizon. The people leave in confidence because they know that the priest and the Levites will carry on temple worship. So this invitation to come bless the Lord is directed toward the priest and the Levites. Those individuals who know God. Come bless the Lord. That sounds like almost a no-brainer. They in the temple. They know God. They spent their life there. But I think it's a word to those of us who are in church. If we're not careful, we can become professional church people and fail to be worshipers. We start thinking because of our proximity and our seniority to the things of God that we don't need to worship. But if God has given you breath, if God has given you life, if God has given you vigor and vitality, if nobody else should get worship right, we ought to get worship right. Because you know how he woke you up.
You know how he started you on your way. You know how he kept you all night and all day. If anybody should worship God, should be the people of God. Come, bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Not only is worship for the servants, but worship is also strengthening. These are the priests and the Levites. They had given themselves over to temple work. They, 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 their life was their work, and their work was their life. Every day they were in the temple, and this was important work, rendering prayers, explaining the book, offering sacrifices, and also standing guard in the temple. Much like the vocational work of the pastor, it's their life. It is what they do. They have dedicated themselves. And notice, this was not easy work. Whoever says pastors don't work, they, they've never stood in a pastor's shoes. They've never slept in a pastor's house. They've never been in a pastor's study. Their work was their life, and the work was taxing. We find common space in the context of this song. Is it life, work, and ministry? Taxing? I say it again. Is not life, work, and ministry taxing? If it's never been taxing to you, it might be indication that you haven't done much. Because the reality, Lily Grove, is you can do a good thing and you can do a God thing and still get tired. Who am I talking to today that you've been paying your tithes, you've been trying to raise your family in the fear and admonition of the Lord, but you still get tired. You don't believe me? Come here, Reverend Dr. Moses. Lord, tell Moses, I, I'm going to put a rod in your hand. And it says, while your people are fighting, if you keep the rod up, your people will win the war. He, he says, as long as you keep the rod up, the people will win. But this is the problem, Unc. The problem is God never told Moses how long he would have to keep his arms up. God just told him you have to do it for an indefinite amount of time. And somebody knows that life is taxing, life is hard. But the psalmist reminds us, even in our work, whatever you do, don't forget to worship God, even in your frustration. Because this is the reality. The more I worship, it means I'm making God large. When I make God large, the smaller my problems become. When I keep God in his rightful place, I don't let them bills drive me crazy. When I keep God in his rightful place, I know them children are going to do whatever they big enough and bad enough to do. But I got a God that's going before me. The higher I lift up God, the smaller my problems become. I know. I know. Someone is listening to me with a critical tone. Yeah. Reverend Parks, do you mean to tell me just because I worship, my problems become invisible? No. Just because I come to worship and I've been worshiping, are you me do, do you have the audacity to tell me that my issues are now insignificant? Absolutely not. But what I am telling you is when you worship God, 
you are making the declaration that I'm not going to allow this to drive me crazy. I wonder, is there anybody in Lily Grove that said, I got a hundred and one problems, but I came here to worship because I refuse to let this get the best of me. I, I'm from the Midwest and we listen to the quartet and I like Lee Williams and the spiritual QCs and I'm riding on the highway and this is my song. I refuse to let anybody steal my joy. But notice this invitation is also specific. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place. This, this call to worship is specific. This is lift up your hands in the temple. There's two meanings here. To lift one's hands in adoration and praise and glory to God. But there's another meaning here. It's not only to lift one's hands in adoration, but it's also to extend one's hands in supplication. I'm talking to someone here today there are moments in your life where you don't always have a dance. There are seasons in life that life fills you with disappointments. And you don't have ecstatic shouts. All you have is tears. Have you been there? When the disappointment is so heavy where you can't put it into words. When life has become so weighty, it has affected your physical physique. You're no longer standing erect and perpendicular. Your, your spine is bent over by the invisible. H have you been there before? Hasn't this been a season of extremes? One minute you get up, you feel strong. And before noon, you're eating ashes for lunch? Great. Have you been there? You come to church and you feel good, but you looked over in the pew and you remember from the pandemic, it was someone who sat in that pew and they are no longer there. Life is full of extremes. And can I tell you something? If life has extremes, so will your worship has extremes. And God does not view us pouring out our souls and telling God what we need as less than worship. He he sees that as worship as well. Lamentation says arise, cry out to God in the night watches, pour out your soul for your children. And can I tell you something? Authentic worship don't need cosmetics. Sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down and sometimes all I can do is make my way to the house of God and when I extend my hands, when I get to God's house, God has a way of lifting the veil of darkness and can I tell you something? Sometimes God doesn't always lift the veil of darkness but he'll give you strength to navigate the darkness and is there anybody here in Lily Grove that can say he ain't lifted it yet, but I'm still navigating. The steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. I'm navigating. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm navigating. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard. I'm navigating. I, I'm, I'm done. I've held you much too long. Dr. Charles Adams from the Hartford Memorial Church preaches a sermon entitled, Why We Ought to Praise the Lord. In that sermon, he tells, he recounts of a story of a woman who worked all of her life 
And at this time, she saved up $100,000 to buy a home in Silicon Valley. You know, that was a long time ago. She, she, she purchased that house. She showed her love and appreciation for how God had enabled her to secure the home. She kept the house clean. Motor on lawn. The house was immaculate. But somehow, the Homeowner Association got together with the bank in an effort to push unwanted neighbors out. It came up with the rule that whoever fails to pay the $200 home, home association fee, they will be eligible to lose their home. We don't know what happened. Some way or another, the woman failed to pay her homeowner association fee. We don't know if it was a limited income matter or if she simply forgot. But the wheel began to turn and they took her house and put it up for auction. The house that she saved for, the house that she worked for, the home that was immaculate was auctioned off for a mere $10,000 to two attorneys. CNN picked up the story. And they began to look into the story and they found the woman. And of all places they found the woman, they found her in church, dancing and shouting like never before. Nine other attorneys saw it and they picked up her case and they arbitrated her case and she was able to get the house that she worked for. She was able to get it back and someone's asking me, Reverend, what are you trying to say? All I'm trying to say is you make sure you worship and heaven can decipher what you need. I bid you good day, Lily Grove. There's the invitation to worship, but finally, there's the commendation as a result of worship. May the Lord bless you from Zion. He who made heaven and earth. This song moves my heart. May the Lord bless you from Zion. This song ends almost like the Psalms of Ascent begin. I lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. The blessing will come from God the creator who makes all things. This sounds a lot like number six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. This is a warm words of commendation. Literally, the text opens with the people blessing God. But the text ends with God blessing the people. This is the mutuality of worship. Listen, God says, I see you in Lily Grove trying to worship. I see you endeavoring to pay your tithes. I see your work and I'm going to bless you in return. Literally, God says, I'm here to tell you that you can't outbless me. It's the mutuality of worship. And isn't that good news to know? And we see something here in the text that God takes on the role of a servant to bless his people. I don't think you heard me today. God, the unmoved mover. God, the mysterious one. God who sits up high and looks low. God who's always leaving where he's coming from and he's always coming from where he's leaving from. God that angels lay prostrate and worship his name. He takes on the role of a servant to bless his people. We see this best in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knowing that he has to go to Calvary. And he's praying in the garden and he says, let this cup pass from me. 
and he goes through the crises of belief, but he comes to the culminating decision and he says, not my will, but your will be done. He kneels as a servant. They put nails in his hand as a servant. He carries his cross up the Vio Della Rosa and only Simon of Cyrene, a black man, helps him carry the cross. He does it all for you and me. Worship is like planting seed. You know, we go to the produce section and we shout in the produce section. And we just walk past the seed section. But true worship is like planting seed. You have to go through a season of insignificance. No, nobody sees you, nobody's looking at you. It looks like life is tough and people are throwing dirt on you. But once you make it through the season of insignificance, then you have to go through the season of invisibility. You're in the ground, nobody sees you, nobody calls your name, and you wonder, does anybody know who you are? But if you handle seasons of insignificance and seasons of invisibility, there's another season called increase. And that's all I came to tell somebody. I know the night is a hard season, but you got to learn how to hold on. Don't you touch nobody, but look in their direction and tell them, hold on. My dear friend, Pastor Daryl Pettis of Memphis, Tennessee, tells the story of a man going through the supermarket with his baby going through the supermarket with his child and the child would not be consoled. He keeps going through the supermarket. He tries to give the baby a bottle. The baby won't take the bottle. And he keeps saying, Jacob is going to be all right. Goes through the produce section. The baby keeps crying. And he keeps saying, Jacob is going to be all right goes down the bread aisle and the baby won't be consoled. He keeps saying, Jacob is going to be all right. Finally, a saintly seasoned woman picks him up and she stays a safe distance and she sees he's having a hard time. And he keeps saying, Jacob is going to be all right. And finally, he makes it to the checkout line. The baby's just having a fit. And the lady said, hey, let, let, let me hold Jacob. He said, excuse me, ma'am. He says, let me hold Jacob. You've been having a hard time. You've been struggling in this store. You can let me hold Jacob. He says, ma'am, you misunderstood me. I, 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 I was, the baby's name is Randy. My name is Jacob. And I was just trying to encourage myself. God bless you, Lily Grove. I'm on my way back to Laura. But that's all I came to tell you is make sure you encourage yourself in the Lord. Have I got a witness? Look at somebody and say, neighbor, I know the road is rough. And the going gets tough. And the hills are hard to climb. But you just hold on just a little while longer. Help is on the way. Have I got a witness? Can I ask you a question? Have you any rivers that seem incrossable? Have you any mountains that you can't seem to tunnel through? God specializes in things that seem impossible and, and he can do what no other power, Holy Ghost power can't do. Have I got help in the room? 
I'm here to tell somebody I know the night time is a hard time I know the night time will keep you waiting I know the night time will give you moments of disillusionment but you can hold on through the night if I can hold out till tomorrow and if I can keep the faith through the night everything will be alright look at somebody and say neighbor oh neighbor hold on just a little while longer we got to hold up the blood stained banner we are soldiers in the army we got to fight although we got to cry we got to hold up the blood stained banner we got to hold it up until we die not only do you got to hold up you got to hold out but you got to hold on look at somebody and tell them hold on hold to his hand God's unchanging hand build your hopes on things eternal and hold to his hand have I got a witness but somebody's asking how are you going to hold out because I serve a Christ that was able to hold out one Friday he died didn't he die it was dark but he died they put nails in his hand they put a spear in his side it was nighttime. they nailed them to that old cross and they lifted that cross but they forgot what he said if I if I be lifted up I draw all men unto me it was night time look at somebody say it was night time they laid up in Joseph's new tomb but they forgot what he said you tear down this temple but in three days I rise again and early and early and early Sunday morning he got up with all power power in his hand look at somebody and say neighbor you can get up again neighbor you'll rise again because can't nobody do me like Jesus can't nobody do me like the Lord can you say yeah say yeah ah! Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Will you look at somebody and say, neighbor, I know it's nighttime, but tell them, be not dismayed. Whatever betides you, God will, God will. God will take care of you, take care of you, take care, take care of you. Want to do it? I said, want to do it? Have you tried him? He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. Yeah, yeah. Ah, no, he's all right.